you for joining our first meet up. Uh, I'm co-host uh, of this event. My name is Mai, and I'm so excited that uh, uh, DEFCON held in Osaka in this year. And I also excited to have amazing event uh, with Avalabos team. So I met Joe a few months ago and uh, have been planning this event with Minoru. <laughs> and Minoru. <laughs> yes. Yes. And so tonight we have amazing speakers, the creator of Avalanche and uh, as you see at DEFCON, uh, Amy, a CEO of Avalabos. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and Leona from to uh, Toy Talk. Uh, there are many great engineers in Japan, but I think Leona is one of the most interesting engineer to uh, product scouting ICO. Uh, that is his project is fascinated by many many geeks. So uh, everyone, you should uh, to try that. And uh, Masahiro from New Economy, one of the biggest media in blockchain space. His media has uh, podcasts and posts every day. Uh, its media bring great news about this industry. So we have amazing speakers and uh, let's enjoy together. And thank you. Thank you all very much. Can, can you hear me if I don't use this? Like, this is okay, right? Okay. Yeah. Much better. So I'm just going to use it like this. Wow. And, uh, thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Maya and team. Uh, so it's an honor to be here. I want to tell you a little bit about Ava, the platform we're building. What makes it different? I'm sure you have seen a gazillion coins come by and talk about what they're going to do. And they all use the same language. But Ava is unique in three major ways, and I want to get that across tonight. And uh, it's entirely different from all 2,000 other coins out there. So let me tell you why. But to tell you why, let me first start out with where we are as an industry, as a space, and where we're going, so that uh, we can sync up on, on what needs to be done. So where are blockchains? It's been 10 years since Satoshi. And the word blockchain has become a, its own special word. That you don't talk about a blockchain, you don't talk about the blockchain. You just say, you know, two suits in Manhattan will turn to each other and say, hey, what's your strategy for blockchain? Right? It doesn't have an article. So uh, the only other word I know that's in this category is the word God. So this is, uh, uh, it's, become, it's become its own special thing. And uh, every company, every finance company, is trying to come up with a blockchain strategy. And uh, there's been about $8 billion that went into it. That's VC money. I don't even count it as real, real money. <laughs> but there's $20 billion of actual hard-earned crowdfunded money. So there's a lot of people who are pinning their hopes and dreams in this space. And so there must be something there. And I've been to various different meetings, and in some of them, I have seen darknet market operators sit at the same table with Bank of England, the old gentleman from the Bank of England. It's a really interesting space. It's amazing that this is happening. Um, in fact, even tonight we have the Open Bazaar folks over there, and I'm sure they know the people that I sat next to. And it's been an interesting thing uh, to see. Um, it's a social movement, and on occasion what I do is I, you know, as a sort of a person, a professor who's getting slightly older, I try to see like, what are the young kids doing today. And one easy way to measure what the young kids are doing is to look at the YouTube songs that people write. And if you look at how many songs are written for Google, for Facebook, for open software, you sum them up, and that's nowhere near the number of songs about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. So there's something happening here. And, and the dream is amazing. Right? So uh, this dream of a, of a disintermediated world where there is really nobody between you and your money, between you and, and the financial assets, is really compelling. It's an extinction level event for many incumbents. Lots and lots of large companies will go and disappear the way of the dog. It's just going to, they're not going to be around anymore. It's a huge opportunity for many young upstart companies. So that's all fantastic, that's all wonderful. But yet the current technology cannot help us achieve the dream. The, the gap between what we can, what we think about, the gap between our dreams 
and the, 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 what, is, what we're capable of doing with the current technology as we have it is just far too large. So, um, and as I said, um, we've seen many, many, many projects. All of the projects are converging. Everybody is copying the same crap from 2009. If you look at them all, we're trying to have finality, quick finality, high throughput. Justin Sun uses very much the same words you're going to hear me use today. So it's up to you to detect the, the material difference, the content difference uh, in, behind the uh, going There are many undifferentiated products. Everybody wants to copy Bitcoin. We are not. We're very different. And I'll tell you why. And we've seen an explosion of crypto products, many of which have failed. So why is this happening? There are three big hurdles ahead of us that I don't see anybody meaningfully address. Number one is the technologies we have are toy technologies. They do not scale. This includes even some top coins. Number one coin is operating at five transactions per second. Number two used to operate at 15 TPS and now just went up to 20, 20 TPS or so. So that's what we are dealing with. That's absolutely nothing. At you know, at 5 TPS, you can barely run, you know, I don't know, the 7-Elevens in Osaka on a Saturday. That's about the max you can do. You can't aspire to replace the United States dollar with something that's operating at 20 TPS. DeFi, it's immensely, immensely uh, promising. But you can't get there at this scale. You must scale with multiple orders of magnitude. And it has to come from something. Usability is absolutely horrendous. Everybody offers the same common lowest denominator service. Suppose you want to build an IoT thing. What are you going to rely on? You're going to rely on, a, on, a, on let's say, Bitcoin, uh, that, which is essentially a bunch of nodes uh, run by a bunch of volunteers. That is a non-starter. You go talk to Samsung, I talk to Samsung, and you tell them, hey, you, you know, did you think about building a second layer on top of, of your platform? They're going to say, no, we will not want to build on top of something we don't understand. There, what is the terms of service? There is none. Okay, non-stop. And the third and, big, well, the third and final big issue is governance. All of these platforms must evolve. There is nobody who can predict how the world is going to be five, ten years from now. And so, how are you going to be able to change what the platform is capable of? It's very, very difficult if you don't have a governance. So these three hurdles must be addressed, and that's what we do. So, um, uh, so okay, so just to be clear, so let's take the top number one coin. Uh, at the moment, number one coin worth $100 billion or more achieves confirmation times, achieves finality in more than an hour. It has very low throughput, we talked about this five transactions per second, and they make a big song and dance about how decentralized Bitcoin is. Bitcoin comes down to 19 mining pools. That's not decentralized at all. Right? So you compare it to EOS. EOS is better than Bitcoin when it comes to this. <laughs> we make fun of EOS, and yet it's better in this, in this particular metric. Um, and of course, store a value. Okay, let's store some value in Bitcoin, except every year, $300 million or more goes to the power company. How is that going to work? This is a terrible, terrible infrastructure to build. Okay, proof of stake protocols that people are, are coming up with are not much better. So these days it's really trendy to go back in time to the 1990s, 1980s and find an old academic protocol that has already been tried and discarded, put some new lipstick on it, put some makeup and, uh, and then call it a new, new platform. Okay, so this is happening everywhere you look and um, they usually can, uh, not usually, none of them can scale beyond a few hundred validators. Facebook's Libra is targeting a hundred validators. Facebook's Libra is using the best protocol uh, of its class. It was designed by my student, by the way, who designed it <laughs> and then left it and is now working on our. So, um, so it just can't scale. And uh, they trade off decentralization. They, they, it's very, very simple uh, to get high TPS if you centralize. And so that's what they do. And of course you can do that, but decentralization matters. 
if you aren't sufficiently decentralized, what can happen to you? Not only can you get served with subpoenas, but they can drag you and put you in front of cameras and uh, call you in front of the Senate like they did with Facebook's Libra. It, it was centralized. There was one, one center, Facebook, and there he was, and he had to go and defend the system. Absolutely horrible situation to be in. And these things are not robust, nor are they, and they're very, very fragile. So, it's time to talk about this big revolution. It starts with a new protocol at the core layer. And before I do that, uh, let me give you a very brief overview of consensus protocols, which lie at the heart of every single system. And it's very, very simple. Until recently, we had two families of consensus protocols. In the 70s, or starting in the 70s, those two individuals, Leslie Lamport and Barbara Liskov, came up with, uh, with, a, um, uh, with what we call the classical <coughs> protocol family. Both Barbara Liskov and Leslie Lamport have Turing Awards for what they invented. It's a brilliant idea. Um, Corda, Hyperledger, these are classical protocols. Ethereum 2.0 is going to be a classical protocol. Um, you name it, uh, EOS classical, Algorand classical, and a whole bunch of others. Satoshi knew about these protocols. These protocols had already been invented. Okay, so they're not essentially all that new. So they had been invented. He looked at them and he said, look, these are too fragile. I don't want to build the next generation open system on top of this. So he invented his own protocol in 2009. And that's the Nakamoto consensus, which requires mining. So that's all great. And, and of course, he doesn't have a Turing award. We don't know who he is. It's definitely an actor. Um, <laughs> so uh, he's a great guy, by the way, for you. Um, but uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, he doesn't have a Turing award, but he has $10 billion. So it's a big deal to come up with a, with a, with a consensus protocol family. It has only, only happened, or it had only happened twice in human history. In 2018, a team that calls itself Team Rocket came up with a new consensus protocol family. It's drastically different from everything that came before. It combines the best of both. It is robust, like Nakamoto, and yet it is efficient and fast, like classical, and it scales like no other. So why is this? Um, I'll just very, very quickly tell you about how classical protocols work. They work really well when you have a small number of representatives, like a Senate. And what you do, or what people do, is they, they write to certain members of that Senate. But for them to work, we all must agree on who our Senators are. If we all agree that this is our Senate, and you also agree that this is indeed our Senate, then everything is great. But if I think that my has left, and, uh, and somebody else has joined, and you don't think that. Now we have two different Senates. When I write, I write to a different set like this, and you write to a set like that. And now the intersections will not match, these protocols will not. So, um, yeah, okay, so this just illustrates this. So, you know, when you take a decision in these protocols, you essentially try to write to a large enough set. It's typically, whoop, typically like two-thirds. You write to two-thirds plus one. And you tell them, hey guys, we're exiting the EU. And then, uh, and then uh, when you read, you read from two thirds plus one. So if you have 100 people, you write to 67. Somebody else reads from 67. That guarantees that this intersection is at least 34 people. Um, and 33 of them could be Byzantine. They could lie to you. But even if all these people are Byzantine, that person over there He's, he's going to be able to carry the message to you. That's what the correctness of these protocols rely on. That's very, very fragile. So that's our biggest problem. The second problem with it is they typically require, not only must I be convinced that we wrote to 67 people, but everybody has to be convinced. So that typically requires all-to-all -all communication. It requires n-squared messages for uh, for for. Uh, uh, for the Senate, for the set of representatives. So that creates, of course, this barrier to scalability. That's why Facebook cannot scale to more than 100 nodes. Everybody knows how Nakamoto consensus works. Everybody knows how this mining process works, right? So you come up with these crypto puzzles, 
there's this incentivization process, da 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 da, this is all very nice. Uh, and uh, so, just, uh, just so where we, you know, this is, you know, the typical talk for, um, you know, what, what happened. Um, so, Toshi came up with this. This is incredibly robust, it's very, very nice. What happened next? Well, when he came up with it, mining was done on CPUs. Everybody had one CPU, one voice. That was pretty okay. Of course, as soon as this happened, people started mining on graphics cards. And you remember maybe in 2009, it became really hard, 2010, it became really hard to find graphics cards. Everybody <laughs> was buying them up to mine Bitcoin. That quickly got, got replaced by, uh, by FPGAs. That got replaced by ASICs. And students were buying them to use uh, free electricity. And in fact, I have a friend, uh, my colleague at CMU, he was refurbishing his lab. So they cleaned out the entire lab. It looks like an empty lab. And then, underneath the floorboards, they discovered another lab of uh, just Bitcoin ASICs mining on free electricity. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so this is a dorm room setup. Um, and of course, you know all about uh, you know, the Chinese uh, uh, mining operations. <laughs> They're always poorly, poorly, uh, poorly wired up. You can see the wire mess on the right, especially. Here's another version of it. This really messes me up like every time I get angry, but there's a good ending to this. It went on fire. <laughs> <laughs> if you look carefully, like that's the one. It's that one. Um, so yeah, be careful when wiring this stuff up. And so you know, you got these. People. Of course, the thing to keep in mind is none of these machines are doing any useful work. They are not processing trans. They're not touching the transactions at all. In Nakamoto mining, you do not touch these. These mining rigs do not touch the the transactions themselves in any shape or form. All of the electricity they spend, they spend on keeping other miners from clawing out their mining rewards. So it is not going into faster processing. The speed of the system is protocol-wise limited. So you could, adding more of this stuff doesn't do any good to us. It simply mounts the poles faster. It makes the polar bears dead faster. And of course, it leads um, money to the, the, the power companies first. Okay, so I want to now tell you about the third family. So this is the background, and this is all we have. Now, as bad as this crap is, this is the best we had until 2018. But in 2018, Team Rocket came up with a new protocol, and I want to tell you exactly how it works. It's very, very simple, and I think everybody should leave here having understood exactly how Avalanche works. It's going to work by repeatedly doing a very simple operation. Okay, it works like this. Imagine that we want to achieve consensus on a simple decision between, let's say, two colors, red or blue. We want to pick one of the colors. We all want to pick the same color. It doesn't matter which color we pick to us. I don't care if we pick red or blue. But it matters immensely to me that we all pick the same color. All correct nodes should pick the same color. So how are we going to do this? So now imagine we're in a giant stadium, not just in here, but we're in a very, very big stadium. 100,000 people or so. If I had to use a uh, classical protocol, everybody would have to talk to everybody else. So 100,000 people would have to send 100,000 messages. So that's 100,000 squared messages. It's a lot of messages. It's not going to work for me. If I had to use Nakamoto consensus, that's like picking a lottery. I say, hey, Sol, you are the miner. You tell us which color you like. We're going to move on from that. That's OK, but then we have to do this mining thing, and we, we end up leaking energy. So here is how Avalanche works. We're in a giant stadium. I don't know everybody in it. I know some people in it, but I don't know everybody. Here in the stadium also, you know some people, but not everyone. So it's a very robust to fluctuations in people's knowledge of membership. And uh, what we're going to do is this. Every participant picks at random a small set of people, say about five. And I say, hey, what color do you have currently? And what color do you have? And what color do you have? You and me. So I poll five people. And I get back responses. And I, let's say I get blue, blue, red, red, blue. So it looks to me like there is, from my sample, like the network is picking blue at the moment. 
and I adjust my own color preference towards blue. You do the same thing, and your sample might be all reds, and it's just based on chance. And we keep on repeating this process for a while. So now, the thing to keep in mind is, when we started out, the worst state we could be in was a completely divided stadium. The stadium would be, let's say, 50,000 people who are blue and 50,000 people who are red. After one round of this, it's incredibly unlikely that it will be exactly at that, at that bivalent state. It will be exactly 50-50 divided. In fact, just because of random perturbations, it's likely that it will be slightly tipped. We will have oversampled the reds or we will have oversampled the blues. And so more than likely, after one round, we'll be 51% red and 49% blue. Just because there's a chance that we'll be exactly 50-50, in which case we're going to repeat this again and again. So the thing is, we do repeat this process. And when we repeat it, what will happen is the reds are slightly more than they used to be. And they're more likely to be selected. And they will, end up, they will uh, cause more people to turn red than blues are capable of turning people blue. So if I repeat this process from 5149, I will most likely go to a different state where there's even more reds, let's say 53%. Repeat it again, there will be about 55 or 56% reds. Repeat it again, now it's going to get faster because there's a lot more reds there. So 56 will take us to 61 or so, 61% red will probably take us to 68, 69, and then after that it's going to go down the hill very, very fast. You can see that if all of us are red except him, he is bound to turn red. So there is a point of no return after which we can start safely committing. You can actually work backwards and com compute this point of no return. Is that crystal clear to people? I, I don't know if I did an okay job. But it's a repeated sampling of the audience, and every audience member who is correct and wants to achieve consensus will put his weight behind the, whatever the responses are coming back from that sample. It seems like a super simple idea, but it, and it is. But it's incredibly powerful. It turns out that in between 15 to 20 rounds, we can achieve consensus among tens of thousands of nodes. So let's do the math. Five samples, I think for 100,000, like if I remember correctly, it's about, um, it's about 17 rounds. So five samples, 17 rounds, that's only 85 messages. It would have been 100,000 if I had used the classical protocol. It would have taken me 100,000 messages to get to consensus. I sent 85 messages and I achieved consensus. Now there's a slight difference between the two. Uh, the second one is probabilistic, the same way Bitcoin is probabilistic. But we can make the probabilities as low as we like to you know, add one more round if you want to. Uh, slightly less than so, uh, so, okay, so this is just an illustration of the same thing. You know, you take this node, he asks a bunch of people, he changes his color based on the response. I don't know what's going on. Is this uh, stuff right there? Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so, yeah, these responses come by. People might turn red or black. They might turn back to black, but it doesn't matter. Ultimately, this is the kind of thing that happens. Even in the worst case, if you start 50-50 divided, it's, you start diverging a little bit, and then suddenly the process just opens up, and you end up having far more of one color and far less of another color, until there's zero of the blues, left. that's the zero lines here. Zero blues, and everybody's red. Yes? And what is the optimal uh, number of water fields? Optimal number of, there is no such thing as an optimal number of peers with this protocol. Is it binary or something? Oh, it can, it, it can be any number. And uh, the, typically the uh, amount of time it takes to achieve co consensus does not depend um, strongly on the number of peers. So uh, if you have a million nodes versus you have a thousand nodes, it's going to be a, a, around the same number of uh, iterations. So you go from 17 to 19, you go two orders of magnitude, so from 1,000 to 
200,000, it's just two more rounds. Let's say if there's a 1,000 uh, validator nodes, yeah. then usually each node needs to talk to how many uh, <laughs> nodes around them in order to start. Somewhere between 5 and 10, and somewhere between uh, about 10 to 20 uh, iterations. And usually it will take like how many rounds? Less 10, to 10 to 20 rounds. Yeah. Very fast. So what does this mean? It means that we have a protocol that's robust. It's an avalanche is incredibly robust like Nakamoto consensus. And it achieves quick finality. What's quick finality? One to two seconds. In one to two seconds, it's done. Okay, so you can commit that, and it's incredibly unlikely that two people decide the two different colors. It's high throughput. We can achieve tens of thousands of transactions per second. The initial avalanche prototype achieved 19,000 transactions per second. The current one written in Go, it's a lot slower. We achieve, I think I'm going to show you what we achieve. I think I have uh, some video footage. Um, I'll just sort of tell you. Um, currently, it achieves 6,600 transactions per second. 6,600 transactions per second. It's lightweight. You can run it on a small node, no problem. It's very low energy consumption. Um, it has some nice features. These classical protocols that people are talking about for Ethereum 2.0 and the like. So they're talking about classical protocols that have a very hard boundary in how they behave. If the attacker is smaller than 33%, they're safe. The attacker is 34%, they're toast. That's why if you talk to Vlad Zamfir about ETH 2.0, he's going to tell you that he expects some consensus failures with Ethereum 2.0. Okay? So we don't. Avalanche does not work that way. You characterize the size of the attacker in Avalanche, and then you pick your parameters. Okay, so suppose you say, well, my attacker can be as big as 33%, and then you run through the calculations in the Avalanche paper, and we tell you, okay, that's going to require sampling five people for 17 rounds, um, and so that's, the, uh, that's the, security, the security guarantee we give you is probabilistic. There might be a, a, a bad decision, like Brian decides red, everybody else decides blue. That can happen, but the likelihood of that happening is once in 20,000 years. Very, very unlikely. So it's less likely than a six block rewrite in Bitcoin. We can make that happen. But now suppose that, the, that you misjudged. The attacker wasn't 33%. The attacker turned out to be 40%. Okay? A lot bigger than you thought. Well, my guarantee to you guys that this kind of a safety failure, that the fact that it would happen uh, at most once in 20,000 years, is in inviolate. I can't make that guarantee anymore. But it doesn't go to hell. It doesn't just disappear like with classic. What happens instead is it's slightly more likely. So it will not happen in what, once in 20,000 years. It will happen once in 2,000 years. Well, that's actually something we can live with. The attacker doesn't really get an immense ability just because he's over a tiny threshold. This is a very, well, a very nice protocol with very gentle degradation. Okay, so I talked about this. Uh, the latency, you know, if you compare comparable latencies, that's the latency for a Bitcoin transaction an hour. Ethereum equivalent security is about 500 seconds. Algorand is a, you know, it's from a famous colleague of mine with a Turing Award, um, and he has one trick, and that trick goes into Algorand, or sortition, that achieves about 50 second latencies. Avalanche is one to two. This is the throughput. Yeah, this is a recent number. So Bitcoin's throughput is five transactions per second. Ethereum at the time we made this slide was 15, it's slightly higher now. Algorand is 320. That's, uh, you know, they just did a ginormous release. They're worth many billions of dollars. Avalanche is getting far more than that. This is a geo-replicated test case. It's got 2,000 nodes in it. So this is not a uh, small, small benchmark. It's not in a, in a data center. It's not on a single machine. Nothing is faked. Everything is actually the right size, etc., etc. So, uh, so we're proud of this. Oh, um, and this is, uh, this is the, the little thing I put together. So on the left-hand side, you see the Genesis Vertex. And uh, there's actually, we have two Genesis Vertices. We have one for governance, and we have one for the actual one. So uh, I want to show you uh, 
an actual recorded run, and you're beginning to see time here, and you're beginning to see transactions come through. This is the transactions for a second figure, and you can see Avalanche make a bunch of decisions. Um, I didn't mention this, but Avalanche builds a graph of transactions, not just a chain. Although it can produce a chain if, if necessary, but it's building this nice graph. This is 11 transactions per second. Uh, okay, we're going into Ethereum speeds right now, and so that's 15. That's kind of nice. Yeah, you can see the, see the number rise in the graph. That's 20 transactions per second. Yeah, it's going up now. So that's about 50 transactions per second. And uh, we're going up from here. At some point, it becomes too slow to, uh, you know, I can't, this thing cannot keep up with the number here. So at some point, this will, yeah, this, at this point, this stops. Oh, you can see the number, 66,000, 6,600 uh, on, this, on this benchmark. It then kind of slows down, and I think we cut off the, you know, we cut off the, the, the benchmark at around this point. So, uh, so it's fast. So people thought for the longest time that Bitcoin, so Bitcoin core developers told me explicitly, look, stop pushing Bitcoin to high speeds. It's just not designed for it. We, we just can never match. And they're right. They're, ne they're not wrong. So we cannot match Visa speeds. And that's true. That technology cannot match Visa speeds. The core devs are actually very smart people. They're right. You cannot just push it to these kinds of extremes. But Avalanche can exceed Visa. Visa gets two to 5,000 TPS on a normal day. So this, you just saw it faster than that in a geo-replicated setting. The security you get, this is not happening at the compromise of security. It's happening with more nodes in it. There were 2,000 nodes in that benchmark. 2,000, it's not a small number. Uh, the Bitcoin public network is only 10,000 nodes. It's one fifth of the, the Bitcoin network. Um, so it provides very strong immutability and it can scale to very large numbers of participants. Any one of you can join this network. Any one of you can become the Jihan Wu equivalent for Ava. So anybody can actually participate firsthand with another. Um, yeah, so uh, and as I mentioned, it's very, very robust. Now I want to change gears. So if all I had was this, then what I would have would be a system that is just a performance system. And I would just be in front of you saying, look, we've got what you always had, but it's faster. I just made it two orders of three orders of magnitude faster. So that's nice. That's not bad, right? So a couple of orders of magnitude faster would really go a long way. I'm sure a lot of you have applications that are demanding. If we're going to do DeFi right, we're going to need a couple of orders of magnitude. But I have something much better than that. Okay? So let me try to tell you how the Ava vision is different from every other coin. There are about 2,000 coins. All of them stole their idea, their core idea, from Satoshi himself. So what do they do? They have one coin, and they have a shill army on social media pushing that coin. They have one scripting language that defines how that coin behaves. And then they have one network, which consists of a bunch of volunteers. And so these, the network implements the scripting language, and then the scripting language, of course, you know, determines how the coin changes hands and so on. That's sort of what we got with every single coin out there. Bitcoin is this way, Ethereum is this way currently, um, and in fact, all of the other coins are this way, this way. Ava is different. In Ava, we have Ava the coin. But we also envision having thousands of other assets on top. Okay. And anybody can create a new asset. When you create a new asset, you get to define which scripting language it should have. And you can come up with your own plugins for the Ava network. So you can say something like, um, I would like to introduce Nishant coin. And Nishant coin is going to have, um, it's going to use Bitcoin scripting language because uh, Nishant likes to use the Bitcoin wallet. And, um, uh, but it also will support zero knowledge proofs and ring signatures, because we want an anonymity. And it has some notion of adjacency. So if you have two coins next to each other, you can merge them, or you can take a coin and split it in the middle. So now what, we will do, what Nishant wants to do is have anonymous real estate 
fractionalized real estate in Beijing. Okay, he figured out the legality of it, and we're going to have it. So he can easily express this on top of Ava. But there is one additional step which is crucial, which really sets us apart. So everything until now you can almost do with, with Ethereum. He gets to say, look, my node, well, I would say my coin, is not implemented on top of the lowest common denominator nodes. My, co my, my coin is not, um, is not going to be supported by these random people who are essentially volunteers. Instead, it's going to be supported on this set of nodes who have a special color, purple. Now, who has a color purple? Nishant, the asset creator, determines that. So if I were to hear this, I would go to Nishant and I would say, hey Nishant, I'd like to be purple. And at that point, he can say whatever he likes to be. He can say, okay, but you have to possess certain characteristics. Like, you have to have extra memory to be purple. There's, there is always the AVA coin and the AVA lowest common denominator network. But you can now create subnets with additional characteristics. And you have a, a legal foundation for anything else you do on top. So you can say, look, you got to have more memory. Or you can say, look, you gotta, you got to put up a, an extra bond so that I, will, I know that you will do certain things. You have to sign a particular legal agreement that you'll be compliant. You have to enforce a whitelist. You have to enforce a blacklist. You have to be located inside the US. You have to be outside the US. All of these special networks can be accommodated on time. So, uh, so this is really, really interesting. It is very, very different from the types of networks that we are all used to that are essentially extra legal. They are designed solely for being censorship proof and not at all for being compliant. If you want to issue compliant assets, then, uh, then none of the networks that we have will work for you. When it's time to make an update for, of any kind, you won't know what you're updating on. Or when you need to build something on top, you don't know what's underneath you. If you want to do some IoT devices, how are you going to do that with what we've got uh, on, top of, uh, on top of Bitcoin? I don't understand, for example, a bunch of the recent startups that we've had that try to do this on top of Bitcoin. So, the Alba vision is different. As I said, many kinds of coins, many different scripting languages, and many different platforms that coexist. So we see the Alba network as an internet of assets. All of these sub-networks all speak avalanche, and it, they enable atomic transfers of baskets of goods that are supported by one group and another group and so forth. So I can exchange a Nishant coin or a Brian coin and so forth, even though the Nishant nodes and Brian nodes might have nothing in common. They end up going through the same, uh, same AVA core. Crucially, if you stake AVA, or sorry, if you stake one of these coins, you know what you're staking. So if I'm a staker for Nishant's coin, I know what I'm buying into. I know that I have to do special things for becoming a purple node. I probably have to put up a bond, and I probably have to promise to keep my records for a few decades. This was real estate. And because I know what I'm working on, I can extract fees that are commensurate with the service I provide. So I'm not going to be charging a you know, fraction of a cent for this. We should be charging a few thousand dollars because we are adding a staker service that goes far beyond the lowest common denominator service. You should charge me that much because you will keep my records for a few decades. And that's how it should be. Well, at the moment, you know, kind of the country of Georgia ended up putting their records on the Bitcoin blockchain. whoop de do, very nice. Well, how, who's storing those records? How are they going to be found? We have no idea. Okay, so AVA is a platform of platforms, and it's a construction kit for digital assets. And it provides this common framework for uh, exchanging these assets. Now, uh, the final uh, thing I want to harp on is governance. Every other coin uh, uses the, the Nakamoto model, right? Nobody wants to be in charge. We want nobody to be in charge of these networks. That's okay. So then what do we do? Well, the creator at creation time fixes all of the critical parameters. So Nakamoto, for example, fixed the emissions curve for all the coins for all time. So uh, sometimes he got it right in the sense that the coins created uh, just equally match demand. 
Sometimes he got it wrong, he mints too few and the price goes up, maybe that's okay. But sometimes he got it incredibly wrong, he mints far more than there is demand. Ethereum today mints far more than there is demand. Zcash most definitely mints far more than there is demand. They should be minting less. That extra money they give out, it's not buying them security, it's just a giveaway. But there is no way for them to change anything. It's so contentious, so difficult to change things. So what do we do with Avalanche? Well, remember how Avalanche works. It works by polling the crowd repeatedly. So what, what we do is we use that process to make governance decisions. Any participant in Avalanche can say, hey guys, uh, I'm here, I'm just a random person, okay? And, uh, but I kind of looked at, at this system and I think we're over minting. Let's change the minting rate from 2% to 1.8%. Why not? Or vice versa. Uh, I looked at the system and we don't have enough stakers. Let's increase the minting rate so that we end up having more stakers. Anybody can propose this. And if there is social consensus, if there is social support for this proposal, then the network will discover that and it will change its operation to match the decision by the network participants. So this is natural built-in governance. And what we're doing is we're using the consensus protocol as a crowd org. And we're essentially trying to measure the crowd's pulse. Now, uh, what this means is we don't have to bake in any critical numbers. There are no magic numbers in the code. So minimum stake, minimum staking period, minting rate, these are all subject to change uh, based on what the crowds believe. So there is absolutely nobody is in, nobody in charge, but everybody is in charge. They all have a say in the financial future of this system. So the Fed has been replaced instead by us all. So that's a very different approach to DAOs, a very different approach to the governance of the core platform. Um, I should also mention that we believe in making technology call. So you cannot, so it's all predictable, it should all be predictable because it relates to things that have carry value. So you cannot change parameters drastically in one step. So you can't go from 2% minting to 2 million percent, right? So uh, there are limits that you cannot exceed. So minting rate varies between 0 to 20, for example. And it can only change by 10% uh, in three months. So you can go from 2% to 1.8 or 2.2 uh, for three months and then you can't change it again until, of course, you get again, you know, after three months and years. So these are also that people can go on vacation, come back from vacation to a, to a predictable system. So that's uh, essentially all I want to say. Um, what I want to conclude on is simply that the internet was introduced in 1962, right? Everybody thinks the internet started in 1993 or so in Netscape. Now it's been around for a long, long time. And we were all you know, users of it, that's you know, some of the older folks around here. We were all using it in the 80s, some of some people maybe even earlier. The explosive growth happened with new technology stacks. So for the longest time, this thing kind of floundered around, just a niche thing that only a few people used. Crypto is no different. It's a huge step in the evolution of money from archaic fiat-based models with people in charge to a new digital foundation. And, uh, and it's going to be crucial to have three things if it's to succeed. One is scale and performance, and I showed you how Avalanche achieves that. The second one is usability, interoperability, and a new differentiated scale of, of, of staking, differentiated uh, scale of services provided by the participants. And the third and final one is flexibility and governance. It's no fun getting rid of the state. It's no fun getting rid of corporations only to become a slave to algorithms that cannot be possibly modified or that are very, very difficult to modify. That's not what we're in for. We like to build technology that serve people and this is one where the people themselves are in charge. So crypto will change the financial world. I firmly said, I firmly believe that it's an extinction level event and it opens up new challenges for us. And that dream that I first saw with, uh, with Bitcoin's white paper is incredibly compelling, unachievable with current technologies, and yet within reach, I believe, with a better foundation. 
So with your help, I look forward to building that building on top of that foundation. And maybe I should tell you a little bit about where the project is and how to get in touch with us. So that's my email address and Twitter. Uh, we have the Avon Labs Twitter up there. We have this Telegram channel. That's the official one if you want to come join it. And uh, the project was funded only in February of 2019. In seven months, well, in five months, we got to the point where we started the private testnet. Uh, we are almost at the point where we're about to go public with the testnet. So we're doing a fundraising round right now. At the end of that round, we're going to open up our, uh, our uh, public testnet. I hope to go mainnet sometime very soon, early in 2020. And, uh, and I can't wait to get to that point and get users on top. Uh, we're talking to a large number of people who are excited by both the performance characteristics and the different network model within the system. And I hope to get all of you involved. And, uh, and I'm very, very approachable. And uh, you know, unlike my Twitter, Twitter personality, <laughs> it's extremely friendly in person and actually also online as well. When you know, so please come and say hello. Please uh, talk to me if you have demanding needs, demanding applications. That, uh, that require a different level of service, and I very much look forward to building that future with you. Thank you.